sun sunny days, you almost felt like you were sitting outside. It was that bright. That surprised you, Grace. It was a factory. I, I thought it would be dark and dirty. Then why go to work there? I was 15. It was time I paid my own way. Pay your own way? What about school? Oh, I didn't miss it so much. The girls were all so nice, and the work wasn't hard. It wasn't like factory work, really. It was more like art painting those styles. We were artists. I'm not really the one you should be talking to. Vaughn's a shock. He's the one you should be talking to. Now, Arthur, you know he won't talk. But it was his process. Tell me about that process, Arthur. You used a powder. We used a powder, and the girls mixed it with an adhesive to make the paint. But, but that whole business with the brushes, I, I didn't invent that. They were doing that long before I started. But you knew about it. We all knew about it. We just didn't know what it meant. Irene, in here. Irene, what are you doing? Shut the door. Amalia's working in inspection today. Is that bad? Not for us. She's going to be sitting in this room all day by herself in the dark checking dials. Poor thing. Poor thing. So we're going to give her a little surprise. Boot like the Cheshire cat. Oh. Won't that make her mad? Let her get mad. That's half the fun. I don't want to make her mad. Oh, Grace, you have to be that way about everything. What way? Your teeth, Grace. Put them on your teeth. Ain't like Amalia don't deserve it. She paints more dials than any of the girls on the floor. You can't be bothered to talk about it either. You say, Amalia, what's new? And she just looks at you funny. I don't think she can speak much English. Well, it wouldn't kill her to smile, would it? She's coming. Get the light. Ready? Oops. Mrs. McNeil. Painting your faces? Have you gone off your minds? It was just a joke. Just a joke? A joke like that can lose a girl her job. No, no, Mrs. McNeil. I'm sure that's not necessary. I don't tolerate no foolishness, Doctor. Yeah, very good. Foolishness we don't want, do we? Mr. Reader, this is the inspection room. All the dials from here that are to be painted. And here are some of the girls who should on the floor be working. Girls, this is Mr. Ida, my new vice president and your new plant manager. And I was just telling Mr. Reader what a fine bunch of girls we have here. I'm sure now you must think I'm halfway out of my mind. Miss Rita, perhaps you would like some bird with you girls? Miss McNeil. Well, girls, this paint you're playing with, it's very expensive. You realize this. It takes several tons of ore just to produce one single gram of radium. Now that's a lot of hard work for our men in the extraction plants. But they do this work black. Do you understand why? Why they work so hard? What we're all working for? The war. That's right. The war. Those dials you paint save lives, girls. Our boys in the field depend on them. To read what they can in the dark, no mistake about what they see. Otherwise, some of those boys won't be coming home. So, girls, if you play around and don't take your work seriously, well, you're playing right into the hands of the Kaiser. And we don't want that to do it. No, no sir. So then why don't we leave the tomfoolery to home and get back to work? Mr. Reader, I, I just wanted to say that I'm sorry. I won't do nothing like that ever again. Well, my dear, just remember this. If you do right by us, we'll do right by you.
May 17, 1921. Nancy Jane Harlan for the New York Graphic, the New York Graphic's only girl reporter. Jack Young with air reporting from the New York Ledger, New York first book for news. Madame Marie Curie, eminent French scientist, embarks on a whistle stop tour of the United States. First stop, New York City, where she is greeted by an enthusiastic crowd of well wishers. The High Priestess of Science is headed to Washington, where she will receive a gift of one gram of radium valued at $100,000. Donated to her by the members of the Madame Curie Radio Club, an association of 100,000 American women, who each gave one dollar for humanitarian research with radium. Grace, over here. Catherine, look, I got my certificate. Member Marie Curie Radium Club. You gave a dollar? It's all for science. Science? But what about my room and board? Oh, there she is. Welcome all, welcome all. I must ask you, ladies and gentlemen of the press, please limit your questions. Madame Carey is about to embark on an exhaustive tour of the country. She is under strict doctor's orders to rest. Although, in the typical fashion of a scientist who can only think of her research, her life's work, she has refused to rest. Madame Curie, what will you do with the radium? Eh? What will you do with the radium? Uh, I will continue my experiments to find better methods for the treatment of the cancer. Is radium a cure for all cancer? Cure for the cancer? Yes, yes, cure for the cancer. That is so. It has already cured all kinds of the cancer. But some doctors dispute that. Since they do not understand the method, there is no question. Radium will cure the cancer. Madame Curie. Madame Curie. Madame Curie, how have you been able to devote yourself to both science and to your children? Ah, it has not been easy, but my daughter share my gratitude to the American woman and her interest in science and in my work. I am most grateful. Madame Curie. Madame Curie. Madame Curie. No more questions. Madame Curie is on a tight schedule. Mrs. Andrew Carnegie has sent a car and will escort Dr. Curie personally, as will I to Washington, where President Carter will present the gift of one gram of radium. Did you, did you see this challenge? This is a marketing opportunity. We'll really need a press release. Uh, radium isn't just something for scientists to study. Uh, the average American can share in its glory every night with luminous watches, luminous clocks. And, and, and for those of you who, who think that these are just novelties, well, Consider the inventions of the past 50 years. I, I mean, the, the, the electric light, the, uh, the telegraph, the, the, uh, the yes, inventions all once dismissed as, as novelties, as, as toys are right. now accessories to modern life. Got it. Then I saw some watches. Oh, watches, absolutely. But that's not where the market is now, Charlie. I mean, you heard the woman. It's, it's in the metal market. It's there and chemical owns it. Only because Bond's shocky lets them take half it. I'm telling you, we could get that half. It's just a matter of position. Standard Code Chemical sends out a journal monthly to 12,000 doctors. We do something similar. Something scholarly. The, 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 the doctors will respect. A bibliography. Oh, with casting articles. With absolutes. That way, the doctors can find the information, find it fast, and they then. They have us to thank for it. Exactly, Charlie. That's the spirit. Advertising. It's the wave of the future. It's not just the product, it's how you promote it. You should have seen it, Grace. The church was filled with flowers, lilies and carnations and orchids. You know how Amalia loved orchids. They weren't orchids. They were orchids, I read. Flats. Orchids. I know an orchid when I see one. Purple orchids. And oh, Grace, that smell. What was that smell? It was like, like, flowers? No, it was like heaven. I was going to say it was like heaven. Like heaven? Catherine, it was just a funeral. Make it out like it was some Valentino picture. It wasn't just a funeral. It was Amalia's. And Grace, it was beautiful. The church was like the botanical gardens, and the company sent a big spray of flowers. Carnations. Mums. Yellow carnations. Those were mums. Well, it sounds like a nice service anyhow. Girls, girls, the whistle's already gone. Now, I've received new instructions this day. We're going back to the old way of pointing the brushes, which was losing too much paint in the cloth. But, yes, to raise something you wish to say, Dr. Von Shashaki, he told me not to do that. He said it's unsanitary. Unsanitary? Well, I can't hardly believe he'd say such a thing. 
We've been doing this as long as I've been here. You must have misunderstood. Yes, ma'am. And you're not to get new brushes until you've done with the old. And they gotta be so bad, you can't get a point no more. You can't make water like that. Well, you'll do your best then, since I have my instructions. I need a new brush. questions, is it? It's for us to do the work. I have my instructions, girls. I have my instructions. Here's an instruction for you, Big Wheel. Let some of the starch out of your corset. <laughs> Was she at the service? Big Wheel? Are you kidding? You think she crossed the street for her own mother? Most everybody else was, though. She was about the only girl from the floor who wasn't there. I wanted to Mom was working, but I had to watch the little ones. You could have brought them. All seven? Well, if it was me, I'd have tried to get there. Just lay off. Grace feels bad as it is. <coughs> Were many of fellows there? Oh, yeah. Lots of fellows from downstairs. Um, Mr. Roth from the front office. Dr. Conchashaki was there, and Mr. Reader. And he left early, so he was there all the same. Oh, and Grace, you know that fella from Crystallizing? What's his name? The one with the red hair? You know who I mean? He was there. The tall fellow with the freckles. That's the one. The one who snaps his fingers all the time. George. Jerry. I think it's George. It's Jerry. Jerry Mallon. He's the one who's always talking to Amalia and David. Oh, that's right. Grace, after the mass, he goes over to the coffin and he goes like this, like this. He goes... No. Yeah. Really? Really? Oh, for pity's sakes. Well, he did. Nobody could believe it. So what if he did? He was in love with her, that so what? Don't you think so, Grace? Well, I guess he had to be. He did that. And can you imagine, can you imagine if he loved her and never told her, never could bring himself to say? Because, because she was so beautiful and, and he was so shy and it's too late. It's too late. He didn't tell her and he's never going to get a chance to ever again. Poor Amalia. Poor Amalia. Poor kid. Her family took it awful bad, Grace. Alvina, Quinta, everybody. Every one of them crying. Even her dad crying so bad. And I've never seen a man cry before. And not like that. Just bawling like a baby. And you know why, too. Because their daughter had died. What she died from. Don't go spreading stories, Irene. It's not a story. Albina told us. No reason Grace should know. Know what? Know what? <coughs> a Amalia? Ain't it awful? Albina said her father's fit to be tied to. Six girls at home and eight. None of them going to a dance ever again. All because Amalia upton died from syphilis. Shh. I can't help if that's what she died from. You don't know that for sure. It was on the death certificate. Anemia and complications from syphilis. But Amalia was ever so nice. Guess she got around more than we knew. Maybe it's a mistake. Maybe the doctor got it wrong. Oh, come on. You could have caught it wrong. Doctors are wrong sometimes. That's right. Doctor was wrong about Ann Ivy. What's Mama got to do with it? Irene, don't you remember? Up to the day she died, doctor said Aunt Ivy would be fine. He said, get a good night's sleep, take a cup of tea. And two days later, he was taking her to Rosedale Cemetery. Girls, girls, your attention, please. The gentlemen are here to make an announcement. Thank you, Mrs. McNeil. Now, girls, we're here today to put a few rumors to rest. And to explain some changes, yeah? Yes. Now, as some of you may have heard, Dr. Von Sashaki is stepping down, and he'd like to take this opportunity for to a To make moment this goodbye. Of... And Ms. Terida has kindly thank Some of you I've known since you were little girls. Coming here during the tour, working so hard. Day after day at the bench. 200, 300, some of you, 500 dials a day. So excited to be a part of our work here. When this company I start, in my own kitchen, mixing up the paints, I knew I found something miraculous. 
Something to make life better, easier, and that. But do I read? More and more uses are there for the radio. More than I dreamed possible. Thank you, Doctor. Yes, thank you, Doctor. <laughs> now, girls, the Doctor is a very busy man and he must be on his way. So, let's wish him the best of luck in his newest business ventures. <laughs> very well, now, girls, let's get back and to work. Mr. And, Mr. Reed, let us give luck wish to you also. To the plate he steps as your new company president. Our congratulations to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bonds. When Mr. Reader yeah. came four years ago to us, I saw him a young yes, man. Yes, great thank you, Doctor. Thank you, great ambitions. Little did I guess the direction in which his ambition would take. But one of the things that makes this country great is the opportunity it presents to a young man and, and so girls, let's make And so, ladies, <laughs> let us wish Mr. Reader the very best in the new direction he intends this company to take. New direction? This, the slow down dial no, to me, and the movement to the medical market, talking market. Talking there's going about. to be lots of changes. Yeah? Now, what, what the doctor is, is, is referring to is some of our larger cu uh, customers are setting up their own dial painting studios. Which means Let's drug our girls here. Uh, in the short run, things might be a little bit slower. However, the Waterbury Clock Company down in Connecticut needs some help setting up its own studio. We were intending to make this announcement next week, but I suppose we'll make it now. Mrs. McNeil? Oh, well, thank you. We'll be asking some of you girls to go on up there. The work is very supervisory in nature, which, which means more pay. Do you have any girls in mind? Uh, Lena McCarthy was one, Sarah Dutch, Catherine Chump. I have a whole list downstairs. I'll post it today. Fine. Well, there you have it, girls. As we're all on the clock, we'll leave you back to your work. Thank you, ladies. My best wishes to you. <coughs> That's back to work with you, girls. You're going to do it, Catherine? You're going to take that job? Would you, Grace? Would you go to Connecticut? Oh, I don't know. That's awful far from home. Tommy would have a fit. But Grace, it'll be fun. Would it be fun, Irene? Irene? Irene, honey, are, are you all right? Huh? Yeah, sure. Why wouldn't I be all right? What? Your mouth is bleeding. Tom, just come close when it pays up for the radio plant. It's office work. Office work. Well, I guess 
that means you'll be spending more money on clothes then. Boy, she is steamed at you. <laughs> I don't see what difference it makes so long as I'm working somewhere. Don't make no difference to me. I just thought you liked it there is all. Sure, I liked it. I worked there for four years. So? I've been delivering mail almost eight years. I plan to keep on delivering mail another 20 or 30 years if I'm lucky. Nothing like good work and a steady pension to help you sleep at night. I don't have a pension, I sleep just fine. I bet you do. So, how come you quit, Grace? Lots of girls are quitting. Work is slow, besides. Since Irene left, it's just not as much fun anymore. And wouldn't you rather have a girlfriend who works in a bank? Well, not as much as I'd like to have a wife who don't work anywhere. Oh, close your eyes, I got a surprise for you. A surprise, ma'am? Want me to draw the shades? Not that kind of surprise. Close your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> You won't kiss me when you're talking about babies. I'm going to need babies eventually, Tommy. Well, sure, Grace, but most girls, they get married before they decorate the nursery. Mm -hmm. Plan ahead for once. Pick one. Is this some kind of test? <laughs> it is. This is some kind of test. It's <laughs> wallpaper. That one. Really? Uh, the other one. <laughs> Which one do you like? Oh, they're both very nice. <laughs> this one's pretty, don't you think? Oh, well, then that one. <laughs> If you like it, I'll like it. Wallpaper's wallpaper. No, it's not. You've got to pick something you can stand to look at for 20 years. Same way you pick women? <laughs> Good up smart I can't see what we never get back this. Okay, <laughs> all right. Uh, this one, this one hands down. I like it too. A nice neutral yellow goes with either boy or girl. And until the baby comes, you can use the room for other things. Other things? Like what? Like a painting studio, maybe? Painting studio? Well, Grace, didn't you get enough painting at work? Not the kind I wanted to do, Tommy. I used to paint watercolors at school, but ever since I went to work, I don't have no time. What with helping Ma and watching the kids. Once we're married, I just want some time. Just a little time for myself. Because I could do watercolors or oils, maybe. Maybe portraits in oil. I can paint a picture if you like. Well, why not? Paint a big picture of me and we'll hang it in the outhouse. <laughs> All our friends will buy just to use the cans so they can look at it. Wait, it's almost the time. Grace, you want to paint pictures, paint pictures. I ain't gonna stop you. You say that now, Tommy, but once you're married, you'll change or two. Well, sure. I'll be whistling Dixie. Wait until you come home some night. I'll wore out. Some Christmas, maybe. When every customer on your roots had three times the mail. Maybe some dog took after you. Some old lady kept you waiting on her stoop, telling you all about her grandchildren, and you wouldn't have the heart to tell her you can't talk. I know you. So you come home all cranky and late, sad, hungry, wanting your dinner, and there I am with my easel set up in the kitchen and a chalk clock on the floor. I paint all over the table, and your dinner is nowhere. What would you say then? Well, it better be a picture of me you're painting. I know what you would say. <laughs> Where's my dinner? That's what you'd say. Where's my dinner? Well, sure, but I'd still admire the painting. Just want to look it on a full stomach. <laughs> so, how'd I do? Pick the right wallpaper? I don't know. Maybe I'll go look at stripes. Stripes, polka dots. I don't care, Grace. Let's just get married already. You're plenty old enough. I'll tell your mom you ain't no longer. We're just going to run off. We are not running off. We're going to do it right. A nice church wedding with flowers and music. And then a week at the seashore, just us. And then we'll get set up in our own place. You'll see. It'll be worth the wait. Your mouth hurt me now. Yeah. The dentist wants to pull another tooth in the back. Well, what's a tooth?
Except she's got a good lawyer. No sort of way you could let her anyway, that lawyer. And she no longer works here. Left six months ago. Well, that makes four now. Three. Four. You count this module. No, I wouldn't think it here. She worked here, Charlie. She also worked other places. And what she died from? You can't catch that here. So, I think you can. That's not funny, Charlie. And besides, that's just idle talk. In my experience, when it comes to girls like that, there's something to idle talk. From a large family, wasn't she? Italians. The conditions they live in. Ten or twelve people in three rooms. It's a miracle they don't all die from one infection or another. Three, then. And how many dead? Only Miss Mama. But I haven't spoken to her people yet. It's too late for them anyway. The statute of limitations is two years. But Miss Kusher is another story. She's in a position to make some trouble now. In all my years, I've never had somebody as much as slip on the floor. And now this? And we're talking about three girls. At how many hundreds we've employed? I suppose six, seven hundred. Exactly. And some of them were sick when they got here. One girl we hired was completely crippled. Couldn't even make it up the stairs. Her father had to carry her up to the studio every morning. You know, it doesn't matter to me how she got up the stairs. She was a very fast worker and a very sweet little girl, Charlie. But she was in poor health. And she needed the work, Charlie. Oh, and not just for the money, to feel productive, Charlie. That's what work does. It gives us a purpose. Now, I, I don't see why we should just stop hiring girls like that. When they get sick, you try to blame us for it? You might want to rethink that. Well, well let's see what Dr. Drinker has to say. Dr. Drinker? Oh, uh, some professor from the Harvard School of Industrial Hygiene. He chairs the department, and his wife's a scientist as well. They've agreed to look at our operations. You don't think we're jumping the gun a bit here, hiring them? Well, we've had six girls quit this week, Charlie, and Mrs. McNeil tells me there could be more. Girls come and go all the time, not like this. They're terrified out there. We, we need something to calm them down. Letting Drinker examine them? It sounds to me like a recipe for mass hysteria. We'll tell them it's a routine physical. Edward? Companies give physicals all the time. Then Drinker will start next month. In the meantime, I recommend we make an offer to Miss Cushion. You're thinking we should sell it? There's very many proof of problems are connected to us. If she sues, believe me, you won't like the publicity of Drinks. Neither of your investors. You don't think this will affect the stock offer? Don't you? Great. We'll open at 30 and then close at 10. Or not open at all. And this money? It'll keep her quiet. It will be a condition of a settlement. Maybe we better do it. But, but, but suppose this lawyer has a racket going. He, he finds sick girls and then convinces them into making lawsuits. Then we just reward him for his lawsuit. Unless... <coughs> unless Miss Kusher genuinely believes she got sick here. It could be like Charlotte said. She comes from a large immigrant family, not well educated, not a lot of resources. <coughs> a little bit of money would mean a lot to a girl like that. Certainly. Pay a few doctor's bills, buy some medicine. From the sound of that letter, I don't think the girl has long to live anyway. So it would be a gesture of decency then? Exactly. Well, what should we offer? March 24th, 1924. Francis Jones here for the New Reporter. Nancy Jane Harlan for the New York Graphic. Could Radium Water cause a cure for crippling arthritis? Dateline, Orange, New Jersey. Radium Water products offer miracle cure for crippling arthritis. Some patients report a significant abatement in their symptoms. Mrs. Jeremy Michaels of the Bronx tells us how Radium Water products transformed her life. My pain got so bad I could hardly bend over while others reported only mild relief. This poor, brave woman could hardly bend over to kiss her little ones goodnight. And I got three. Well, let me tell you, they are a handful. Dr. Harrison Martin, Chief Medical Examiner for Essex County, commented on the studies. Preliminary, at best. Your recommendations, Dr. Martin? I advise further study. Further study. Then Mrs. Michaels tried Rainathor. They said it would help my rheumatism. So I drank a bottle a day for a month. It wasn't cheap, but I was desperate. The test sample is questionably small. Well, it first hit me like a bolt of lightning. It was that powerful. Now I drink a bottle a week just to maintain my health. I scrub the kitchen floors and hang laundry like I'm always done. Dr. William J. A. Bailey, inventor of Rainathor, reports strong demand for his products. <laughs> Dr. William Bailey of Orange, New Jersey, reports Rainathor sales exceed 100,000 cases worldwide. Radioactivity is one of the most remarkable agents in medical science. I drink Rainathor myself and can vouch for its potency. Bottom 
bottle of dead. And a dollar a bottle. Worth every penny. Yes, indeed. I myself was the picture of lethargy before I discovered the amazing, vitalizing qualities of radiant water. I am nearly 50, but I have the energy of a man in his 30s. You rather look like a man in his 30s. Well, <laughs> thanks. A testament to the twine's potency. Or to the seller's creativity. Read it for. It is perpetual sunshine. And a perpetual money machine for its inventor. Is there no end to what science can do? Maybe we should have made an appointment. Don't need no appointments. But it's a busy place, Catherine. If you don't have an appointment, maybe you should make one. I shouldn't need no appointment for this. I'm sorry, I don't find anything under Shaw. <coughs> under Rudolph. Rudolph? The girl I'm asking about. I mean Rudolph. Did she file a complaint? No, the dentist did. The dentist? Dr. Neff. I read dentist. He said she might have bossy jaw, and he was going to complain to the health department about it. But when I asked him, he said he had heard nothing, and it's been more than six months now. Bossy jaw? Yes. Catherine, it could have been like the doctor said, a blood infection. Yeah, but what gave it to her? That's the thing. Where is it from? From dirt. You get infections from dirt. From dirt? Her face puffed up like a pumpkin. Her jaw rotted so bad she can't eat nothing. You think you get something like that from a little dirt? You get it from phosphorus. They're telling everybody it's radium in the paint, but really it's phosphorus that makes it glow. Well, honestly, Catherine, we can't really believe that. You saw her grace. Catherine, if it was like you say, they would have never let you work up there in the first place. Well, sure, they had to shut the place down. Who? Who's gonna shut it down? I don't know. County? Honestly, Grace, you're such a ninny. Now, hey. How are they going to shut it down if they don't know about it? Ever think now, that? Now, come on. It's all right. She has no business speaking to you that way. She's just upset. Upset? She, she's gone around the bend. She probably thinks they're, they're putting arsenic in the drinking water. Next to me, they're, they're stealing babies and using them to stoke the furnace. Go ahead and laugh. You won't be laughing so hard when it's you come in here six months from now asking after Grace. For crying out loud. Catherine, it's just a toothache. Just a toothache? That's how it started for Irene. You wait, Grace, you wait. You wake up one morning. Gums are hurting so bad you can't open your mouth. So weak and sick you can't stand up. Stop it, the Catherine. The pain's so bad you can't sleep. Your face so swollen you can't stand the sight of yourself. I said stop it! Grace is fine. Right, Gracie? Irene Rudolph, that's it. She worked at the radium plant? Yes, ma'am. Nothing. Huh? Yeah, no. the, the company, they're in compliance with all state health and labor regulations. They ordered the analysis of the paint and... Let me see that! Miss, really? Who is Miss Young? That's the health officer. Miss! The paint is a harmless compound of radium and zinc. As I was saying, the analysis shows there's no phosphorus in the paint. There's no phosphorus anywhere in the plant. I'm sorry. There, you see, Catherine? Well, maybe we can get some lunch then. I, I want to file another complaint. They already did an investigation. I want to file another complaint! Catherine, these folks are awful busy here. I want to file another complaint. I just don't see what good this is going to do. Grace, three surgeries, and they wanted to cut her again. She finally said no. She knew. What was left of her jaw rotted so bad. The smell was terrible. And Grace, the worst of it is, I couldn't look at her. She was so afraid of dying alone. But I left her alone. And when she died, it was in the middle of the night, and no one was with her. Wait, wait. 
think you better schedule that surgery. Couldn't, couldn't we put it off a little till after my wedding? You don't have this surgery. You won't have a wedding. What? Ms. Fryer, I, I need you to listen to me. Your jawbone is decaying. That's the black pus oozing out of your gums. It's the bone itself. That, that, that's impossible. To Mr. Arthur Reeder, U.S. Radium Corporation, from Catherine Drinker, Harvard University, enclosed is our report. Ah, uh, finally. We believe the trouble in your plant is due to the radium. I... Radium? It can't be as bad as This can't be. Put off the surgery and you will develop a septic condition. Could be fatal. The blood changes in your employees can be explained on no other grounds. I've caught. I've stayed from my wedding. Photographic films carried by employees show heavy fogging. Well, I got a suggestion And we suspect you. high levels of gamma radiation throughout the plant. Go to the radium plant and explain your situation. Go to the company. We realize no proof can be offered at the present. Once they see what kind of shape Th This is but impossible. But a view of the material in the literature yeah, and the facts disclosed by our report. I don't see how they could refuse. We recommend immediate and drastic remedial action. Look. If you want, I'll write to them for you. They can work for me. Pay my bills directly. You think they do that? The Charlie! Moral obligation, don't you think? I guess so. We'll do it right now. I'll go get some papers. This has to be a mistake. This just, this just has to be a mistake. Charlie! They must have made a mistake. They must have done something. I mean, if we're suffering from some new ailment caused by radium, it should occur generally throughout the plant. What do we expect? There's several hundred milligrams in solutions in the big vats and several hundred milligrams in the ore and, and several hundred milligrams Hold back us, and filled with tail. Well, there's radium present in all parts of this property. If it really was the radium, you'd expect the incident to be highest in the laboratory. And no one is sick there. Perhaps it's some combination of the radium with the zinc? Or, or maybe it's something peculiar to our plant alone. Some kind of bacteria in the brushes. Or whatever it is, it can't be the radium. I, I mean, there's dozens of application plants across the country. None of them have ever reported anything like this. The Department of Labor wants to see the report. Yes, I'm aware. What are we going to do? What are we going to tell them? This ruins us! They want to see the report? Send them this. One page? The most important page. Dr. Drinker will never stand. Drinker works for us. This is a proprietary report. The Whatever Department of Labor. Always oh, give me time, Charlie, please. We can get shut down the scientists' government, Ben. They don't know what it takes to run a business. Von says shocking club that advertising was a dirty word. I can't tell you how many times I walked into his office and he just turned a deaf ear to whatever I had to say. But we showed him, Charlie. We showed him. We are the world's largest suppliers of radium. The largest in the world. Do you know how much work it took for us to get to this point? Do you think I'm just going to idly sit by and let our good name be dragged through the mud? Vincent and Giant. What's that? That's 
an ulcerated condition of the mouth, my dear. From the radium? Oh, no, no, no. An unfortunate and rare result of poor dental care. So, let us be a lesson to you. Always brush your teeth. There was something else about this in the paper about, about other girls who got sick. A girl I've worked with for a while. She's in the hospital in New York. And the doctors don't know what to do. They've never seen anything like Ms. it. Miss Breyer, don't tell me you pay any attention to what you read in the papers. Those stories are not scientific. But Reporters the... are not scientific. They do not follow scientific methods. They write to sell, not to educate. The scientist is not concerned with what sells. He is concerned with the truth. He undertakes years of painstaking study to arrive at an understanding of intricate natural processes that most people never presume to comprehend. You would do well to listen to science and ignore the nonsense that is printed in the newspapers. Because I can tell you right now, radium has nothing to do with what's ailing It doesn't? Not in the least. Then what is ailing me? Poor diet, Miss Fryer. Poor diet. But Dr. Neff said Dr. that... Dr. Neff is a dentist, not a physician. What you have is a vitamin deficiency. You must eat more fresh fruit. Hard to do in the winter. And raw meat as well. <coughs> raw calves liver, particularly. Cook it, if you must. But eat it twice a week at a minimum. How much do I owe you, Dr. Oh, I'm a scientist, Miss Fryer, and I take a purely scientific interest in the situation. By allowing me to examine you, you are helping me to further my own studies. For this, I thank you. Call me anytime, day or night. Okay, Dr. Flynn, thanks. Happy to be of service, my dear. Nothing's wrong with you. Your blood is better than mine, he says. And how's the rest of the report coming along? The animal studies we conducted reveal no adverse effects from the radium. The problem, as you suspected, is one of personal hygiene only. I can't believe someone would do that. Just treat out why do like that? Nothing surprises me. It's exactly the way you said, Catherine. Those people will say anything. They'll do anything except the right thing. Well, we're going to make them we're going to make sure someone thinks about this. Well, this all checks out. Thank you, Dr. Flynn. I'm, I'm very grateful to Flynn. I'm particularly grateful to hear that that young girl you examined is doing so much better. Oh, didn't examine her, no, no. I merely consulted with her, folks. It's, it's all the same. She's doing much better, isn't she? <coughs> From what I can see, Mr. Reader, she appears to be on the road to recovery. Excellent. Well, here's my statement of fees and expenses. Mr. Lee will draw you a check.
Well, we hope that you'll join us next door for some light refreshments. Okay, you want anything? My throat's a little dry.
1927. Francis Jones from the Newark Ledger. Nancy Jane Harlan for the graphic. On the strange case of the radium girls. Who claim they are poisoned at the hands of their employer. And now they seek your day in court. $250,000. That's the price tag on their suffering. $250,000. Ask me, it's all a sham. What do you mean? Those girls are very sick. Sick of work insurance. Doctors say the radium girls only have a year to live. Only a year to live and 250 grand to spend. What would you do with that kind of money? What would you do to ease your last suffering days on earth? What would you do with $250,000? I'd buy a wardrobe like I read castles. <laughs> I'd give it all to charity. Then I'd travel the world. First class with all my friends. I'd play the stock market. I'd buy myself a fur coat and a diamond the size of New Hampshire. Yeah. It to pay off my medical bills. Pay off the second mortgage on our house. The one my father took out to pay for my last operation. Pretty Grace Fryer sits at home, suffering bravely through this entire ordeal. Struggling valiantly to keep up her flagging spirits for the sake of her family and friends. It hurts to smile, but I try to smile. I know if I don't smile, I'll go crazy. Tell us, Miss Fryer. How does it feel knowing you have so little time left? <laughs> I try not to think about it. <laughs> it must get you sometimes, knowing what you've been through. And the company's getting fat off your labor. And all they have to say about it is... No, no comment. comment! Don't you just want to punch somebody? I don't know, that one too, no good. <clears throat> I'd rather just think about how it's, how it's gonna be. When justice prevails. <clears throat> Then I can do something nice for the folks. Maybe send them on a trip. They never did have no honeymoon. What a fine example of womanhood. We can only aspire to bear our cross in life as nobly as this young girl. Mr. Barrett, I must object to this kind of histrionic. I had nothing to do with this. I've been in this game a long time, Mr. Barrett. When I see a story like this, move over the wire. I'm not so naive as to think that a plaintiff's attorney had nothing to do with this. What's your proposal, Mr. Markley? Fifteen hundred dollars to each girl. Fifteen hundred dollars? That's not even a year's wages. We think it's very generous, considering your case won't survive the statute of limitations. This is a case in equity, sir. The Chancery Court will come to a different conclusion. The Chancery Court can't rewrite the law. And the law is clear. Two years from the date of injury. Your clients are out of time. Two years from the date the cause of injury is discovered. Very creative, Mr. Barry. <clears throat> Very clever. I have to admire your imagination. But you have a long way to go before you convince the judge. And in the meantime, Mr. Markley, the press will continue to take a great interest in the story and in the company's complete indifference to its workers. No doubt they'll prove to be good press for their consumers, Lee. And you accuse us of exploiting these girls. You're the one hiding behind the statute's limitations. Hiding, Miss Wyland? You know very well the law never anticipated a situation like this. These girls <laughs> were dying years before anyone knew the cause. Before anyone knew. Does that include the U.S. Radium Corporation, Ms. Wiley? When, or should I say, if, this case goes to trial, I only hope that's your opening argument, Mr. Barry. You will have made our defense. See you at the The arrogance of that man. Tell me again the purpose of these articles, Ms. Wiley. Public sympathy, Mr. Barry. That's the engine of reform. You are antagonizing the company. Then our strategy is working. And what about the girls? How does it help them to read in a dozen different newspapers that they have so little time to live? Mr. Barry, surely you can see the U.S. Radium Corporation cares nothing about the girls' as poisoning. But the average housewife in Orange cares very deeply, and so do millions of other women across the country. These women, they shop, they buy watches. Markley can be as smug as he likes, but the Consumers League campaign will reach only one outcome, and he knows it. That's why he was here today. 
I only hope you're right, Miss Wiley. Public sympathy, Mr. Berry. Wait and see. Dear Miss Fryer, I read of your woeful situation in the Atlantic Constitution, and I am prepared to offer you girls a solution. Venicine. Venicine is a wonder tonic made from all natural ingredients. The venicine will restore your health and vitality. We are prepared to offer you girls a lifetime supply of venicine in exchange for the exclusive rights to use your pictures in our advertisements. Dear girl, I read about you in the Billings Gazette. I run a hundred head count up here and do very well by myself. I have always longed for companionship and am well equipped to offer you girls a comfortable home in your final hours. Don't you think a girl like you will suffer so much? Deserves a few fleeting hours of happiness in your final hours? Sincerely, your admirer. Larenette Watkins. P.S. Enclosed is my picture. <laughs> Look at this, Catherine. This man actually sent a picture. <laughs> you all right, Catherine? Me again. Shall I get the nurse? No, it, it did this before. It'll stop. Maybe we should go. No, don't go. Don't you mean to sleep? Who can sleep? I never sleep. Yeah, well, you'll sleep tomorrow. Might not wake up. Of course you'll wake up. Not if it don't go so well. Sometimes you don't come out of it so good. <coughs> My mother's cousin, she went into the hospital for her appendix, and she didn't come home again. You just can't think that way, that's all. <coughs> Look at this now, Catherine. Miss Wiley said folks would be on our side. She sure was right. Here's one from California. What if we don't win? Of course we'll win, but what if we don't? My father will lose his house. We'll be on the streets. You'll be on the streets too. Your father must owe thousands, and you and Tom, you won't never get married. How can you stand it, Grace? Please. How can Tom stand it? Don't you ever wonder? I don't never hear him complain. Catherine, as soon as the judge hears our testimony, He's gonna rule for us. All I gotta do is take one look at us. We'll be over in a day. You think so? Sure. When I see what kind of shape we're in, it'd be awful hard to ignore, don't you think? That'll be something then, won't it? To see the look on Mr. Reader's face when we get on the stand. Now you wanna read some more letters? Well, they didn't have any vanilla, so. I got some chocolate. <laughs> Still long enough. Don't get on me. I had six people stop me on, on my way over here. All the reporters and all the masking after you. Waiting for me to die. No one is waiting for you to die. It's true. One of them called my mother, asking if I had died yet. When she said no, he sounded disappointed. <laughs> Try to eat a little of that. You'll feel better. Evening, girls. How about a picture? For the love of Mike, what are you doing? We need some photos for the graphics exclusive on the girls. Exclusive? What are you talking about? $5,000, that's what. What do you say, Grace? Think you could use $5,000? I 
don't understand. Perhaps you're familiar with Bernard McFadden. Who, the faith healer? Herbalist, Mr. Creator, herbalist. Bernard McFadden's patented herbal therapy is just what these girls need to get back on their feet and the graphic will pay for it. All we ask is the exclusive rights to their story from here on out. Here, see for yourself. You want to pay us to see Bernard McFadden? Easy money, huh? Let me see. Grace, they're serious. The graphic always does business on the up and up. I don't know. Grace, what? <coughs> what is your father on the house again? I don't know exactly. And the last hospital bill, that was at least a couple hundred, right? At least. Maybe we should think about this. And all we do is talk to this herbalist fella? <laughs> well, we'd have to get our money's worth. A regular series of features with pictures, documenting your treatment, your recovery, or otherwise, depending on how it goes. <laughs> and then you print whatever you want. Maybe we add some color. Everybody adds color. Don't sound so bad. Maybe we should talk to Miss Wiley about it. Miss Wiley? What's it to her? You're the ones with bills to pay. Wouldn't be right to do something like this without talking to Miss Wiley. You're a big girl, Grace. Can't you make your own decisions? Of course I can make my own decisions. You take it it was from the company. They owe us a lot more than that. Yeah, if you ever see it. Maybe we should, Grace. I just don't feel right. Grace, you're going to talk to the reporter about folks anyhow. Why not get something out of it? He's right, you know. Why should you give your story away when people are crazy to read about it? Believe me, you girls can cash in big. The day we ran the feature on you, bang, sell out every copy at every newsstand. Everybody can sympathize with the play of some poor, sick girl facing certain death with no hope of fulfillment in motherhood. <laughs> I'd like you to go now. My friend is tired. She needs her rest. Grace. Grace, come on. At least think about it, Grace. Sure. Think about it. I understand. You're worried about what people will say, but hey, you gotta think about your own interests here. Look out for number one. That's the way. Everyone else has to get what they can, for sure. Why should you keep your nose clean when everyone else sucks with their elbows in it? It's a business proposition. 
<laughs> I'm just looking out for my best interest, the same way you look out for yours. Mr. Lee, why don't we see this man at the door, please? All right. All right, you don't want to play ball, that's fine. But believe me, when all this sorts out, I won't be the one holding the short end of the stick. Gentlemen, I'd like you to make statements of what happened here today. We'll send them to the State Dental Society. Then we'll see who's playing ball and who isn't. That's an excellent idea. I don't know. Perhaps we shouldn't be so quick to dismiss Neff's proposal. What do you mean? We're in a very bad situation here, Mr. Reader. That's true. Mr. Lee says you're having trouble getting girls to work here. But we've lost some contracts because of it. And it's only going to get worse. Papers are full of stories about those girls. Make them out to be saints. And what defense can we put out? Except to say that we'll try our case in court. And in the court of public opinion, we've already lost. Perhaps we shouldn't be considered. It certainly wouldn't hurt to have testimony from the dentist who treated those girls. That could be very helpful for us. We should retain him. Retain him as what? An extortionist? As an expert. Like Dr. Flynn. Dr. Flynn is a highly respected professor at Columbia University. Ned is a neighborhood dentist. But Flynn treated some of those girls, didn't he? He didn't treat them. He consulted them. He dispensed medical advice. It wasn't medical advice, Charlie. It was an expert's opinion, a scientific opinion. How about this? We retain him, but we don't put him on the stand, just so we keep him from testifying for the woman. That's the most important thing. Yes, I agree. That's the most important thing. Do you agree to something like that, Mr. Reader? Mr. Reader. Mr. Reader. Mr. Reader. Edward, we can't possibly do this. We can't possibly get into bed with a man like Neff. Arthur Frank, we Neff don't could, want to. Neff could be dangerous. We have to take steps. Neff has already given up everything we need. New evidence, gentlemen. This is grounds for postponement. Three months. Three months to study an extra. It's outrageous. And the girls. Do you see the girls? Their eyes are like saucers looking at me. Terrified. Mr. Barry. How are they going to hold out three more months? Catherine Shaw could barely make it to the courtroom today. And Grace. She was trying so hard not to cry. Of course, I had all the answers. Go home, girls. Get some rest. That's the best I can do. Get some rest. You're doing wonderfully, Mr. Barry. It's a difficult case. I don't understand people like Martha. And Reader, how can they play this kind of game? With those poor girls sitting right there. Maybe this will help to explain. I received a letter. You'd think the company would be eager to take care of this. With the kind of publicity this has got. No. Martha seems to enjoy the sport of it. What it can get away with. It's cold. Very cold. Mr. Barry. What's this? It's from Catherine Drinker of Harvard. She's an industrial hygienist, the one who worked with her husband on the study of the radium plant. It was a joint effort, actually. That's very interesting, Miss Wiley, but I've already seen this document. There's nothing in it that can help us. You've only seen part of it. Mr. Barry, please. This is the complete report. Mrs. Drinker has been following our story very closely in the papers and was particularly disturbed to read that last part in the ledger, the one where Mr. Lee says her study clears the company. He doctored the report. Reader doctored the report. Apparently he pulled out one page listing the blood conditions of a dozen employees and passed it off as the whole thing. It doesn't look so bad by itself, does it? But in context, it's a somewhat different picture. We can use this. Yes, it should impress the judge. The judge? It's wild. I'm not going to wait three months to make use of this. I want you to call that contact you have at the New York world. If Reader won't let us present our evidence in the courtroom, then he can read about it in the newspaper. December 12, 1928. Francis Jones for the New York Ledger. Nancy Jane Harlan for the New York Graphic. The Radium Girls go to court today. Radium Girls knock on the doors of justice. Will they be heard? These poor girls face pain, disfigurement, ruin, and death. And as the clock ticks away the precious moments, a hearing begins in Chancery Court, where the U.S. Radium Corporation demands a postponement. As plaintiff's attorney Raymond Berry makes a shocking disclosure, showing the company lied to the Department of Labor, showing they distorted the results of a Harvard study, concealing the ill effects of their product. Read all about it in the Ledger. Read about it in the Graphic. We can't because you care.
that. You didn't treat it? They make a point not to these days. If only other people would do the same. Miss Mitchell, from across the street, she walked right past me this morning, didn't say a word. I know she saw me. And at the market, the green grocer, the way they glance at each other, and at the club, Miss Middleton and the other ladies, the whispers. Why did you read something else? And at the club, they said, actually had the nerve to say to me, is it true? Is it true, she said? Did your husband poison those women? I said, Miss Cowles, if you think it is true, then why would you speak to me at all? I, I certainly would not associate with a woman whose husband did such things. Well, why do you go to them? If that's the way that people just treat you. I, I can remember for you. What, what do you want me to say, Diane? That, that I knew we were poisoning people, but we didn't want to stop because we were making too much money. Is that what you want me to say? I certainly don't want you to say so. Even if it were true? Or especially if it were true? Is it true? Is that what you think? What would you like I, to say? I mean, for God's sakes, Diane, don't you see what's going on here? It's, it, it's bombs and shock. He's the one behind all of this. He's, he, he's jealous of our success. He's, he's feeding information to the consumers league so they can railroad us. Because it's a bunch of do good as radical women. Reds probably have them socialists. That's what they are. Same thing with that club you belong to. What? Uh, you women make You go around solving the world's problems while your husbands go out and make a living. You know, you're going to quit that club. Quit the club. And stop please, talking to not. that woman, Mrs. Middleton. She doesn't know anything. You're not making None of you any women sense. know anything. You don't know anything. Did you lie to the Department of Labor? Did you lie? I didn't lie. I just, I, I just didn't agree with Drinker's results. Arthur. I have a fiduciary duty to this company. I, I can't I, listen to Diane, I have documents. I have articles. People with tumors the size of baseballs, Diane, with radiant therapy, they disappear, Diane. in the boardroom as you can in the church. Do you remember? You think I'd forget? I was such a scared kid. And he, he was my kid. If it weren't for you, I, I don't think I could have stood up to him. I, I know that. And, and ever since, he's been looking for signs that my soul is lost. You don't know that, do you? That, that, that my soul is lost? You're a good man, aren't you? You save lives, I am. You save lives. It's all for you. Everything I do, it's always there. You know. This is not the time to be talking. I've just got the phone with someone from the ledger. And this couldn't wait until morning? I'm sorry. Good evening. Mr. Williams. I just... Dr. Lane. Dan? He's dead, Arthur! What? He died this morning. This, this can't be. I mean, I just saw Dan last week. Yes, they were just here for cards. They were just here. Dr. Marlin's already done the autopsy. Saying it was a severe anemia. Let's go and blame the radio. Well, I'm just going to run it on page one. I told them we put together a statement by 8 o'clock. That's when they need it. They can run it tomorrow. What are the services? Sorry? The services. 
I don't know. We'll send flowers. Diane? Yes, yes. We should call Louise. Oh, call Louise. No, we should go over and I see her. I wouldn't do that. Why not? She's planning to sue. Louise? She's filing a long wrongful death lawsuit. Worked up a statement for the company. Company chemist for eight years. Always in poor health. Recently in the class. But Dan was never sickly. He was always in the garden or sailing or on the golf course. He kept a beautiful garden. Why don't you we talk about this in the morning, Sean? <laughs> You're right. I'm sorry to be the bear of bad news, Mr. Reader. Good night. Charlie can be a bit excessive. You need to explain. We're going to have to make so. I, I, I don't know what I'm going to say. I'm going to have to make a statement. Right. You need to explain. Please. I'm going to get rid of this now. This half a case under the safe. And we'll get rid of that too. We'll have no more of it in this house. Diane. I made it too far. I really didn't expect you to. February 21st, 1928. To Mr. Raymond Berry, from Harrison Martin, Medical Examiner, Essex County. We have examined the remains of the deceased Amalia Maggio. Our study reveals the following. Radioactive substances have been found in large quantities in the lower jaw, the upper jaw, and the lumbar vertebrae. No evidence of syphilis has been found. Body is radioactive. Bones of dead girl kick off gamma rays. Captain Wiley of the Consumers League of New Jersey declares, new evidence shows the company lied. Dr. Joseph Neff, a New York dentist who treated Amalia, has turned over portions of her jawbone which he removed from her mouth. This x-ray film shows the jawbone is still radioactive five years after the girl died. <coughs> will this make your case? Will this force a settlement? Make our case? No. This gentleman will make our case. Last night, the graphic exclusive, the founder of the U.S. Radium Corporation, broke his long silence with this shocking announcement. Radium is one of the most dangerous substances known to man. Dr. Vaughn, this is shocking. Is it true that you assisted in the autopsy? Yeah. And given my expertise in radium extraction, I was able to determine Miss Magia absorbed enough radium to kill 10 people. Doctor, what does this say about mild radium therapy? Are you now advising against it? Radium is responsible for the death of these poor girls. It should be considered a most dangerous substance. Do you agree with the doctor's prognosis that the radium girls only have a year to live? From what I've seen, they'll be lucky to last that long. Tommy. 
Grace, there's a house for sale in my brother's neighborhood. Two rooms up, two rooms down. Not much, but it's a start. You'll like it. It's already got flower wallpaper. And the best part, it's only two blocks from the school. The school? What do we need for the school? Plan ahead for once. Tommy, what do you think is going to happen? After all of this is over, do you just think everything will just go back to the way it was before? Well, why wouldn't it? I got to see the surgeon again. Uh-huh. I caught some more fluid. He's going to drain it. OK. And then his test will be so more. So deal with it and when it comes. More. It's still more. How can you see that? How can you talk about buying a house and, and getting married when you know that there's nothing? Grace, I can't think about that right now. I just want for us to be together now. I want to come home to you at night, to my wife, my home. I'm too old to be living like this, this, this in-between, this in-between life, Grace. I promise you, I'll do whatever it takes to make it easy for you. Want it. Tommy, please, are you going to make me say it? it? You're, you're tired? You haven't been getting a lot of sleep? I'll, I'll be back to see you tomorrow. Tommy! You get some sleep. Tommy, don't be dirty to me! Tommy! Consideration you offer. Settle with these girls. You have to settle with all the rest. Neff was right about that. This, this is just the beginning. Get a conversation between Markley and Barry. Come up with a figure that those girls can accept. For God's sake, Arthur. What are you trying to do to me? You want to wipe me out? You have to wipe this off the table, Charlie. Every penny I could buy in the last seven years, I have sunk into this company. Why? Because of you. Because you said it was a sure thing. No miss. Why well, work for Vonsashaki when we can work for ourselves? Remember that? Take a chance, Charlie! Take a chance! Charlie, we were fooled! We were fooled! Vonsashaki fooled us all. I, I mean, the best thing we can do is just try to clean it up at this point. No. Do this, and it's the end, Arthur! You're stepping down. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> well, don't you know? The one vote away from taking you off the board, and whose vote is that, Charlie? Arthur, have you so little faith in me? I'm still a stockholder in this company, Charlie. You don't have enough votes to get me off the board. I'll still be on the board. And still on the hook if this company goes under. Think about that. Make sure your consciousness turns to weigh on you. March 15th, 1928. To Raymond Berry, attorney at law, from Edward Markley, counsel, U.S. Radio. One of our key witnesses has encountered a serious scheduling conflict, which makes it impossible for him to testify in April. We have therefore requested an, an extension until June. As we request for settlement, every case involves some humanitarian aspect. Therefore, I'm afraid, that cannot be the basis for settling this one. 
but I have no doubt you will be rewarded for the good work you are doing. If not in this world, then in the next.
This is a confidential settlement. Yes. You didn't say nothing about it being confidential. That's standard for most legal settlements, Miss Fryer. We like to protect our privacy. And yours also. It cuts both ways. You agree to keep silent about the terms of the settlement, and so do we. That seems fair. You need a pen? I have another question. Grace, Mr. Mark, we already explained the settlement to you. Mom. I don't mind. What is contributory negligence, Mr. Markley? It's not in that one. It was in the other papers that you filed when we did lawsuits. The Radium Company said its defense was statute of limitations and contributory negligence. I'm not sure what you're asking, Miss Fryer. It means it's our fault, don't it? It's a standard defense, Miss Fryer. I wouldn't take it personally. How else can I take it? Mr. Markley, Grace had an awful headache all day. Maybe you could just leave the page. Maybe he can just answer the question. Why are you doing this? Why didn't you tell me Miss Wiley was here? You would already made up your mind. She would just try to talk you out of it. What did she say about Catherine? <laughs> Mr. Markley, if you could leave the papers. Mom, what did she say about Catherine? She said, it don't look good. Perhaps I should come back later when Miss Fire is feeling better. You didn't answer my question, Mr. Markley. And I'd really like an answer. Because let me tell you, I quit school at 15. I went to work at the radium plant because my folks needed the money. At your factory, you told us what to do, when to do it, how to do it. My folks didn't raise me to make trouble. So I didn't make trouble. I did what I was told. I never asked questions. How do you get contributory negligence out of that? As I said, it's a standard defense. There's nothing standard about what happened to me. We deeply regret your situation. But there is no evidence to tie your condition to any action by the U.S. Radium Corporation. Then why are you giving me this money? It's, it's a humanitarian gesture. A humanitarian gesture? Mr. Mark, humanitarian? Month after month you put us off. Delay after delay, knowing how sick we were, how tired, how desperate. Humanitarian? You're just waiting for us to die. Grace, please, stop this now. Mom, one by one I watched my friend get sick and die in the most horrible way. And you think I should be grateful? For any spare change they throw at me. Miss Fry, this is a very generous offer under the circumstances. I would advise you to take it because it won't be on the table for very long. What do you mean? If Miss Fry does not sign within 24 hours, you'll be forced to withdraw our offer permanently. Grace, he's lying. I beg your pardon, Miss. You're trying to tell me that I don't sign these now. When I came back a week from now and said I changed my mind, you'd still rather go to court. You'd still rather some judge get a look at me and take your chances. I won't win on sympathy alone. 24 hours. You're just trying to bully me. Very well then, Miss Fryer. I'll take that as a no. And we'll see you in court. Yes, you will. You will see me. You and Mr. Reader both. You call that man back. We're going to court, Mom. What are you trying to prove? You know you can't win. I want them to look at me. I want them to look at me and explain how it's my fault I got sick working in their factory. And what will that get you? What? Mom. All my life, I've done what other people told me to do. I quit school because you said I should. I put that brush in my mouth because Mrs. McNeil said I should. I never said please once I finished school. I never said I don't like the taste of this paint. I never argued. Even though I knew mom, I knew something wasn't right. That night I'm high in bed. 
see my dress hanging on the back of the closet door. All alone. My shoes on the floor. My hairbrushing comb on the dresser. So much light, Mom. So, so much light. I never once questioned. I never once asked. Don't you see? I knew I wouldn't. That's what they were counting on. Quite a bit. 
Page 96. I'm sorry. Okay, the last chapter. Last chapter. Read it to me. Rating. Dangerous effects. Dangerous effects. How many articles do you have listed there, Arthur? 10, 15? It's about 18, it looks like. How far back do they go, those articles? I, I don't know. Look at it. The first one, there. What is the date? 1906. 1906. Now, let me see. When you go into court, you plan to testify that you had no idea radium was dangerous. How can you say that, Arthur? When your own book says it was, how can you say that you did not know? I... 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 I, I never... I... 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 I never really read the book. That's that. I... I never really read, read, read the book. I, 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 I just take a look at the I, 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 I just take a look at the at the at the, the gardens. I, 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 I just and out and out and outside the company. The, the, I, I just. standard arrangements. An outside company prepared the piece. They were responsible for the content, which you never read. I think you will find, Mr. Barry, that very few company presidents read their own promotions word for word. It has your name on it. You authorized the book's release. When you had final approval of the content. Mr. Lee was in charge of our promotional efforts. I entrusted those activities to him. Now, Mr. Reed, you testified that you started at the U.S. Radium Corporation in 1918. Yes, sir. As plant manager. And you held this position for how long? Well, about four years. Four years. During those four years, how often did you venture into the studios? Every day. Every day. So you must have observed the girls pointing the brushes to their lips. I, I don't recall. Don't recall. You're saying you went into the studio every day for four years, and you never once saw a single girl. I, I said I don't recall it. You don't recall it. What do you recall, Mr. Reader? You're an awfully young man has such a faulty memory. Objection! I withdraw. No more questions. Your witness, Mr. Markley. We have no questions for this witness, Your Honor. All right, gentlemen, please approach. I'm ready to issue my ruling. Your Honor, we have yet to present our defense. I realize that, Mr. Markley, but this proceeding is to determine standing. Now, I've heard enough these two days to make that determination. The radium in the bones of these girls is an ongoing source of poison in their systems. Nothing your witnesses can say will change that fact, will it? Our witnesses are prepared to testify that the company could not have known about Mr. Markley, in the interest of justice, I'm asking that the defense rest without calling any witnesses. We can conclude this hearing today and schedule the case for trial. All right, Your Honor. Fine. I therefore rule that the statute of limitations has not been exhausted and that these girls have standing to sue. Your Honor, one thing. I have a very full schedule with two other cases pending, and a key witness will not be available until the end of the summer. We can't be available until September. Your Honor! I'm sorry, Your Honor, but our chief expert witness is associated with an institution of higher learning. As it is the busiest time of year for him, we cannot expect him to appear. Mr. Martin is responsible for that situation. He is the one who has demanded continuous delay. Your Honor, we have just agreed to waive our right to present witnesses at this hearing. Surely you will not force us to go into trial without the presence of our key witness? All right, Mr. Markley. 
Trial is set for September. This hearing is adjourned. Why can't Lynn appear? He's going to hear it. Yeah. But, but he's known about this for months. <coughs> Very clever, Edward. I mean, how long do you plan to keep this up? As long as necessary. Mr. Barkley. Mr. Barry, congratulations. I never thought the court would go for it. You know full well these girls can't wait until September. One is so ill, she can't appear in court. My client has the right to make a defense. We will not wait until September. I promise you that. One way or another, we will find room on that docket. Your expert witness be damned. That girl keeps looking at me. I wouldn't worry about it. She thinks that it's personal. That, that I planned it somehow. How do I make her understand that I didn't mean for any of this to happen? You don't. You don't make her understand. You don't talk to her. She looks like death, Edward. They all look like death, Arthur. May 17, 1928, Nancy Jane Arlen for the graphic, Brenda Jones for the ledger. Brandon Barry seeks trial date for early summer. As the U.S. Radio Corporation announces a settlement. A settlement? $12 for each girl per week and $10,000 for life. $12 a week? Additionally, the company has agreed to pay the medical expenses of each girl for the remainder of her life. The girls have agreed to submit themselves for a periodic examination before a panel of physicians yet to be appointed. Questions? What led to the settlement? Is it an admission of responsibility? What about other pending cases? It was purely for humanitarian reasons that the U.S. Radio Corporation has agreed to the settlement. We admit no liability whatsoever. Where will the company go from here? The U.S. Radio Corporation is pleased to have brought such a lengthy litigation to a close and looks forward to many more years helping out its customers and this community. And that's C.B. Lee, President. Captain Wiley of the New Jersey Consumers League, our press statement. Were you pleased with the outcome, Ms. Wiley? Finally, these girls received some compensation for their suffering. But more importantly, the issue of radium poisoning has been brought to public awareness. Thank you, Ms. Wiley. Uh, and the spelling on that, by the way, is Catherine with a K and Wiley with one L. Grace. 
Are you glad? I mean, you don't feel like you back down soon, do you? He didn't back down. They backed down. so vividly, the brushes moving, the dials, the paint, the dials, to their lips. Try as I might, Harriet, try as I might, I cannot remember their faces. I never saw their faces. Thank you. 
Thank you.